thank you, Jim. I think Jim has mentioned the importance of the day and how important it is to get your input in us prioritising the very dynamic research that's going on at Moorfields and um, our uh, sister institutions throughout the world that we collaborate with. So what I'd like to do in my talk is give a framework and an, uh, a, some basic understanding in which to um, under, um, put together the rest of the talks that you're going to hear this morning. So before I start talking about age-related macular degeneration, I'd like to, to give you some basic concepts of what's going on in the eye. And that will help you understand, to some extent, the problems that exist in age-related macular degeneration and the strategies in how we're going to address those problems. So if you think of the eye like a camera, to get a good picture, you need a functioning lens and a good film. But the eye is slightly different than the film of a, uh, the, the film of a camera. The, in the film of a camera, if you think of the picture, the level of detail on the side of the picture and the centre, the grain of the film is the same. The film of the eye called the retina is different in that the, the detail in the centre is much, much greater. The grain and the sensitivity is much greater than on the side. And that central area is called the macula. And that's important for reading and fine vision. And when light hits those densely packed cells in the centre of the macula, it turns light into pictures your brain can understand. But like any energy-dependent process in the body, it produces waste. And those millions of cells produce waste. And the light hits them. It damages the cells every time light hits them. And the eye is an amazingly clever organ. And it's evolved to rather than repair those tips of those photoreceptors, to actually get rid of them. And it sheds those millions of tips every single day. And there's a layer of cells underneath which act like waste disposal cells called the retinal pigment epithelium. And they process those waste products and, for most of our lives, efficiently get rid of them. However, when you get to a condition called age-related macular degeneration, as its name suggests, age is the biggest risk factor and probably affects the ability of those waste disposal cells to effectively get rid of the waste. Macular is because it, those dense cells is where most of the waste is produced, and that's where the disease first hits, those important cells, important for reading and fine vision, and then degeneration. So what we think of as going on in age-related macular degeneration, at some point, that normal process of getting rid of the waste is less efficient. Waste builds up within those waste disposable retinal pigment epithelial cells and underneath, and that causes inflammation. And in the majority of Caucasian patients with this condition, they have slight genetic variants in our defense system that, that controls inflammation in the body, and that accelerates the process and the damage. And the underlying process is, is something called dry macular degeneration. You've probably heard of these terms, dry and wet macular degeneration. So I'm just going to define those um, uh, in a consistent way that we're going to use for the rest of the morning. So the waste builds up in those cells and under the back of the eye, and over time, the inflammation causes loss of those waste disposal cells. And secondary loss of the, the photoreceptors, the, the light-sensitive cells, and the blood supply. And if we all live long enough, that early dry macular generation eventually causes loss of those cells or atrophy or late dry macular generation or atrophic macular generation. So the underlying process is waste buildup or early macular generation to geographic atrophy if we all live long enough. That's the default pathway as to what's going on. But in some patients, approximately a third, a second event can happen where with this inflammation, the eye tries to heal itself. And a common wound healing process in the body is to grow blood vessels that leak blood that form scars, which is great if you cut your skin, you get bleeding, and you form a scar. But in the macula, it's counterproductive. This wound healing response that's triggered of leaky blood vessels, the wet macular degeneration, because there's leak in the macula, is actually counterproductive. We don't fully understand why some, not all, patients develop this secondary complication of wet on top of a background of dry. 
So that's a brief overview of what the underlying process is, and I'm going to talk about wet and dry very simplistically, and these, the details will be filled in with my, by my colleagues in the further talks. So you're probably aware we have pretty good treatments for wet macular generation. We have two licensed drugs that are injected at regular intervals in the back of the eye. So do we need better treatments for wet macular generation? So although these treatments are transformative, in real life, if we look at tens of thousands of patients that we have done, we realize that although patients get slight recovery of vision, over a few years, the vision slowly tails off. And with time, they lose function. And part of the problem is we're not getting patients early enough. And the biggest determinant of how good your vision is at two or three years is how early we start the treatment. We need treatments that are slightly more effective than our current treatments, and we need treatments that last longer. Because to deliver these treatments at regular intervals is problematic, both for a stre stretch healthcare service and for patients and caregivers to be able to attend regularly when they may have other health issues as well. So the three areas we are addressing in our research is getting patients earlier to start treatment, to have more potent treatments than we currently have, and there are a number of clinical trials underway of stronger drugs than our current one at blocking the chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor that tells blood vessels to grow, to combine the current drugs with a second drug that may be more potent at blocking blood vessel growth, and lastly, to be able to give these drugs in much more sustained ways, either by little capsules we put in the eye that release the drug over months, or by something called gene therapy, to allow the cells inside the eye to produce the drugs that we need, rather than coming back for regular injections. So there's a lot of exciting work going on in WET that will make our treatments even better and more deliverable. The second area, and most more importantly, and my own personal research interest, is the underlying process of dry macular generation for which we have no proven treatment at the moment. So in this process, we have waste building up that causes inflammation and cell loss. So the way we're addressing to treat this condition is firstly to stop the damage happening in the first place. And my personal interest is, to, is in the development of drugs that stop the, the key waste that's toxic to the pig, pigment or waste disposal cells. Another approach is to block the inflammation inside the eye, and we'll hear a talk about the, the encouraging early phase clinical trials to block the inflammation in something called a complement system later this morning. Um, the second approach is we can't stop the damage, but can we make the cells survive longer? So the cells are stressed by all this waste building up, and there are a group of drugs called neuroprotection drugs where we may be able to make those cells survive longer. And there are a number of clinical trials in the area. The last approach is, well, we're limited by stopping the damage in the first place. We may not be able to protect the cells, but once they're dead, can we repair them? And this is where the stem cell approach comes in, is where you've lost cells or the cells are unhappy and then you replace the cells, and the key target is the, the, and the easiest target is the waste disposal cells, the retinal pigment epithelium. So there are three approaches to dry macular generation. We have no currently proven treatment for this. That's to stop the waste buildup, to protect the cells that are under stress, and then to replace the cells with a stem cell approach. So that's a brief overview of what, what's going on in age-related macular degeneration. That to understand what the dry form is and the natural underlying processes go from early dry to the atrophic form, and a proportion of patients get a secondary complication of wet AMD. My personal interest and my long-term hope is that we can treat at the early stage to prevent the secondary complications, but that's some way off. So we need to attack the disease in multiple different points, and for the rest of the morning you're going to hear a number of these different approaches. Thank you for your attention. I have dry macula, and I'm wondering why it's not, I've been told that it's not possible to have cataracts done in that situation. The combination of the two, I mean, so if I had cataracts, if, it would clear uh, some of my If side. I go back to the analogy of the eye being like a camera, to get a good picture, you need a good lens and a good film. Now, if the film is damaged, changing the lens may improve the quality of the picture 
modestly, but it may still be limited by the macular degeneration. And it's a judgment call by your personal physician as to how much the cataract is contributing and in discussion with yourself, make a judgment as to when the appropriate time is to operate. The cataract will inevitably progress, and at some point it probably may be beneficial. But that would be an individual discussion with your but doctor. Can you confirm that it is not a dangerous... It's, n it's not an absolute contraindication. I'm no. happy to talk to you later, okay. if, if necessary. Thank you very much. a question immediately behind. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hi. <clears throat> can you tell me if there's a sort of final common pathway that dry AMD also arises a condition like it with the inflammation and other conditions like central serous retinopathy? So, so <laughs> interesting question on central serous. I went to an all-day meeting on central serous, which we were starting to find a pathway but don't have all the pathways. But for AMD, I think it's, for underlying dry AMD, I don't think we have all the answers yet. And I, my feeling is going to be more like atheroma in heart disease, where we understand multiple bits of pathways, but we may need to target more than one. It may not be a magic bullet that will treat it all. A bit like atheroma in heart disease, you need to reduce several risk factors, maybe statins and, and uh, surgical approaches um, to, to treat that. So I hope there's a magic bullet. Um, but I suspect we may need to treat in multiple pathways. Could I just have one more question? Are statins useful in dry or wet AMD? Excellent question. So um, the jury's out. We know that statins have two roles. They reduce lipids, and some of them reduce inflammation. And as I mentioned, inflammation is a key player in age-related macular degeneration. In population studies, statins have had, if we look at populations and say, in patients who have statins, do they have less AMD than the ones that don't? It's mixed. Some studies suggest it is protective, others that don't, but it's confounded by patients who are on statins of heart disease, and heart disease is related to AMD indirectly. One gene has recently been found in a lipid path that is also implicated in AMD. There is a trial by a colleague in Australia trying to answer this question, but I'm not sure how definitive the answer would get. It's definitely not contraindicated, but at the moment I would not actively suggest going on it. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one more question, um, just over here in the front, please. Thank you. Is there any similarity between uh, the age-related uh, maculopathy and myopic maculopathy and if so, is the, if there is any treatment, will be in any way different in uh, high myopic maculopathy? Thank you. Um, so we, there are similarities, but we think the underlying pathology is different. So in myopic maculopathy, the main problem is probably developmental, because the eye grows far bigger than it should in most forms of myopic macular disease. And the macula and the tissues and the blood supply are much thinner and friable. And in myopic maculopathy, you get worn out patches at the back of the eye that are similar to late dry atrophic macular degeneration, but happen much earlier. The, the, there are other similarities that in the thin layers, blood vessels can grow, and the approach to treatment is the same. However, Really where all the myopic maculopathy research is going into is trying to understand why eyeballs grow too long to prevent it in the first place. So they, are, they have similar features and some similar treatments, but the underlying process we think is fundamentally different. It's a more of a structural problem in myopic maculopathy that causes the secondary problems where is in age-related macular generation, it's the pigment cells that with age are not functioning as well and not getting rid of the normal waste. Yeah, and uh, I mean, will these people with high, uh, my, uh, with high myopia uh, will be also more prone to age-related then? I mean, they will have then a combined um, uh, disease, I mean, a combined factor, well, it's, uh, it's the, both, both myopia and, and age. Such. So in, in terms of population studies, myopia is not a specific risk factor, but 
the trouble is when you have myopic maculopathy, it tends to happen two or three decades earlier than age-related macular degeneration, and therefore it would be difficult to detect that. We don't think there is an increased or decreased risk of getting AMD. Thank you. Very good question. I'm myopic myself, so I have a personal interest in that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.